is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus, Jesus. There is
in this place. The Lord is good, amen? amen. His mercy endures. Aren't you glad that He walks with us through the fire, that He's our Redeemer, our Savior, our Rock? Yes, Come on, He should be. If He's not, you're in trouble. The rain's coming. Right. Make sure our house is built on the rock, not the sandy foundation in these times for sure. The rain's coming. Amen? Amen. amen. We're going to receive the tithes and offerings for the day. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. We'll get one to you quickly. Of course, you can give electronically is the best way to give. You can go to the website, cornerstoneofadrian.com, and click on the Giving tab. Download the Church Center app is the best way to do it. If you need some help with that, we can definitely show you how. Probably just talk to Kara. She'll help you do that. <laughs> of course, we can all give you a hand. But we love you. Welcome. We're glad that you're here today. Amen. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house to hear your word, to fellowship with other believers, to embrace ourselves and engulf ourselves in your presence today. Father, help us to be more like you in every way. May we think your thoughts, speak your words, do your ways, Father. May we walk out of here with an impartation from you today, changed, renewed, and inspired to advance your kingdom in all things in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. 
Sing hallelujah. 
altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was broken, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this morning. I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us on the cross, Lord, your blood. I thank you that we can come to you and ask for help, for forgiveness, Jesus, and that you'll wash us and cleanse us, Lord. Thank you for this service today. Bless each person, Father, that they receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You receive it today? Yes, sir. Come on, give somebody some love. Kids are dismissed. God, today we ask you to hear our prayers. We ask for healing. In a day where we are so connected to the world, set us apart. In a time of great unrest and uncertainty, we ask for holiness. So search our hearts, renew our minds, and help us love like you love us. Make us holy. Use us to do your will on this earth. God, today we ask that you would restore us. Gather up the bits and pieces of our souls and mend them with your loving hand. Search out those parts that we try to hide from you. Today, God, we invite you in. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. We trust you. May we be set apart for you. May we be holy. Check one, two, there it goes. Okay, so good morning, everybody. I'm glad that you're with us today. <clears throat> We're talking about wilderness survival. This is part two. We're still defining the wilderness, amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity again to share your word with your people. Now more than ever, Father, we ask you to invade this building, to move up and down the aisles of every seat in this room, Father. Begin to minister to us in a way, Holy Spirit, that only you can. I pray that you begin to till the ground of our hearts to receive the engrafted word. May we be alert and receptive and get everything out of this today, Father, that you desire in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, so what is the wilderness? We're talking about being in a place that maybe it's a little more difficult to succeed. We're talking about specifically how to grow and thrive in dry times. Have you ever been in dry times? A couple times. You guys have been saved now for, what, 45 years? Serving the kingdom of God about 45 years? For 20 years old, that's an amazing fact, yeah. <laughs> Have you had some dry times ever? Mountaintop moments and valley moments, I'm sure there's been a plethora of, amen. 
So we're talking about how to remain victorious in barren places on the way to our promised land. Amen? So the wilderness is a moment where you're going to find your identity. The wilderness is a moment where you're going to find out what you are really made of. It's a preparation time. It's, it may, if, if you're not careful, it will appear as a very discouraging time. If you're not in the Word of God and you're not listening to the Holy Ghost, if you don't have a clear vision of the promised land on the other side of this wilderness, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. We need to be careful to understand this. We don't want you to fail during these times. We want you to succeed. So you need to understand that your character is going to be developed in these moments. God's going to allow you to go through them to develop that character. And this, you know, the wilderness is a place where, one of the, where, where that is done. One of the places where that is done. It's key to understanding to have victory in these moments. It's key to understand that this is not your destiny. The wilderness is not your destiny. It's not the place where you start you know, building the foundation and planting roots and growing. The wilderness is a moment on the journey to your promised land. Don't pitch a tent there. Don't dig wells there. Don't plant roots there. This is a place that we're passing through. And so if, we're not, if we don't have this understanding of the seasons that we're going to go through in our lives, you will have hardship. You will have discouragement. You will have frustration. And if not careful, even defeat. Come on. Because you don't understand where God is trying to lead you to. So that's what we're trying to do in these sessions is show you what is this moment, what is God's purpose for these moments, and what's on the other side of these moments. Amen? So we talked a lot about what the wilderness is not last week. The wilderness is not a time of punishment. It's not a time of disapproval from God. It's not a time where God brings you into the wilderness to ab abandon you in some way. It's not a place that, or a time where you're put on a shelf until God decides to use you somewhere down the road. That this, that this is not where we're at. The wilderness is not a place of defeat for those who obey God. I'll stress that last sentence there. It's not a place of defeat for those who obey God. And so with that understanding, again, what is the wilderness? Why am I there? What is its purpose? What is its benefit? Many people fall into self-condemnation during these moments, not God-condemnation but self-condemnation during this time because somehow they think they've missed it or somehow they're not pleasing God in their lives. And that is, this is the result of the, this punishment or this pressure that I'm feeling is, is the result of some bad choice I made along the way. That's not what the wilderness is. And so we've understood the meaning and the purpose of the wilderness if that's where it's at. We need to, be, we need to have not only understanding of what is beyond the wilderness, but allow that knowledge to give you the strength and the courage to get through it. Amen. And we see many examples of this. You know, the wilderness dweller list, if you could say it that way, is long, either in the Bible or just in throughout history of mankind. Last week, we talked about Moses and Joseph. We talked about Job. We even talked about Jesus and all of their wilderness moments that they went through before they fulfilled their destinies. Amen. Many men and women have gone through wilderness moments before they went on to do what they were called to do. And the ones who actually made it through the wilderness went on to do some pretty amazing things for God and for His kingdom. So our encouragement is that's you. That you understand wilderness moments, that you survive and thrive in your wilderness training moments, get to the other side and actually produce some abundant fruit for the kingdom. Amen. Jesus successfully completed His wilderness training, and so we're trying to be like Him in all things. The wilderness is a time of preparation, it's a time of equipping, training, it's a time of building your faith, for, and all of those things are tools in your belt to get you to the place that God planned for you long ago. You do realize that when God knit you together in your mother's womb that He had a plan for you. And the Bible says that He wrote that plan down in His books before the foundation of the world. He has a plan, and it's, been, it's a plan that's been laid out for a long time if we'll walk in God's plan. But there's things in our lives that need to be developed in order to fully embrace and be victorious and even handle the calling that God has in our lives. Amen. And so again, the Bible is full of examples of things like this, and we can look to their stories and learn. We can see how to have victory in our lives by looking at their stories. We can see where some made it through and how some missed it. And learn from their mistakes and their, their events. So again, so the events in the Old Testament 
are examples of, they're foreshadows of the life that we're going to live in the New Testament. You do realize that we live in the New Testament church, correct? We now live in a new covenant, sealed by the blood of the Lamb. You know, this is Palm Sunday. This is, you know, this is the week, the holy week going into the weekend where, where Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection took place. This is the week where he's riding into Jerusalem as the reigning king, and they're, they're throwing their coats on the ground as a, as a sign of their obedience to their king. They're, they're, they're praising him, shouting, Hosanna, save us, right? And those very same people by the end of this week are chanting, crucify him. You understand? We're in a new covenant now with Jesus Christ because of what he did this week. We're in a new covenant. And so the events and the processes of the Old Testament will help us to gain understanding of this New Testament covenant that we have and how to walk through these wilderness moments. It's only through, I believe, incorporating the law and the prophets in our study that we can fully understand whatever, what, how, how God is dealing with His church, how God works with His church, and really His purpose in these wilderness moments. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5.17 says this, this is Jesus talking, Do not misunderstand why I have come. Again, talking about the Old Testament. I didn't come to abolish the laws of Moses or the writings of the prophets. In fact, I have come to fulfill their purpose, to accomplish their purpose. He said, I tell you the truth, that until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose has been achieved. Isaiah 55, 11 says, God's words will not return unto him void, but must accomplish what he sent them out to do. Meaning if God spoke, those words have to accomplish something. And if they haven't, then it's not done, but it will be. Do you understand? They must accomplish what he said they will do. And so the Holy Spirit, as we read the word of God, as we read the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is going to illuminate truths from the Word of God, revealing mysteries to us from the Old Testament that will help us in the New Testament. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, 11. It says, these things happened to the children of Israel as examples for us. They were wrote down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Is that us? And so we can look in the examples of the Old Testament and see how did they make it, how did they miss it, how can I learn, what did they do wrong, what did they do right, and how can I be the best, fill your name in the blank, person <laughs> that God created? How can I do it? So in other words, God wants us to benefit from the lessons and the lives of the patriarchs and the prophets of the Old Testament from this verse. Would you, would you conclude that as well? So even though many Old Testament prophecies may have historic fulfillment, it doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to our lives in our current state, in our current time frame. Job 23, 8 and 9 says this. This is a classic example of a wilderness moment. Job said, I go to the east, but he's not there. I go to the west, I cannot find him. I don't see him in the north, he's hidden. I look to the south, and he is concealed. So Job is looking for not only the presence of God, but a moving of God in his life, and is having trouble finding it. Ever been there? <laughs> Ever been there? If you haven't, you will be. And the key to understanding this thing is that Job, what Job missed is that God is still working behind the scenes in Job's life even though he can't see it. He's saying, I'm looking everywhere and I can't find you, God. But that doesn't mean God stopped to exist. Or that God is off his throne somehow, that God's lost his power. That's not the case. He's still working even when you can't see it. Job 23.10 says, God knows. Say, God knows. God knows where I'm going. Thank you, Jesus, that he's in the driver's seat, not me. He's got it under control. So as long as you don't lose your faith or lose your bearings in the midst of this thing, you're going to win. Because God never leads us to anywhere but victory. Agreed? But let's keep reading. I don't even want to say but. However, you know, let's just continue in this thought. Let's finish Job's thought on this. He said, when he tests me, do you know that God tests us? Nobody likes that, but that's what it says. God knows where I'm going, and when he tests me, I'm going to come out pure as gold. There you see the motivation. You see that there is a God who is leading, who's going to bring us through some things for, for a reason. He wants us pure, pure, the purest gold possible to use as a vessel of honor for him. 11 says, 
for I have stayed, I'm not, I'm not going to lose here, because I've stayed on God's path, I have followed his ways, I didn't turn to the right or to the left. 12 says, I didn't depart from his commands, but treasured his word even more than the food I eat. You see the heart? No matter what he was seeing around him, his heart was, I'm after God. I'm after the kingdom. I'm in passionate pursuit of digging into his word and finding truths that I can apply to my life. In that place, how can you lose? Come on. God knows exactly what is happening in our life, and he has a plan. And just because God's presence or active activity in your life is not noticeable does not mean that he has stopped working. Doesn't mean that he's not there helping us out in our lives. You know, when we first received Jesus Christ as Lord and had the Holy Spirit come into our lives, hopefully that's you, that you not only got saved but got baptized in the Holy Ghost and now speak in tongues according to the Word. That's what it says. God's presence was marvelously revealed to you when you got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. We call on His name. He would instantly respond when you prayed. His presence would manifest just like with a newborn baby and his family. Right? As a newborn baby, you receive a little more attention than the older children. And every parent knows that newborn babies require constant care. Right? They got to be fed. They got to have their little butts changed. They have to be bathed. They're constantly messing up their clothes. You got to keep changing them. You're getting up in the middle of the night. Constant care. Why? Because they can't do anything on their own. They are completely dependent upon everyone around them to do those things. They can't do it. But eventually the child must grow. The child must be allowed to mature. If Caleb was still, if we were still wiping his little tushy and dressing him every day and bathing him, there would be something wrong with not only him but us drastically. Agreed? There is moments in our lives that we go through that skills are developed for the rest of our lives. And I believe this is where a lot of parents are missing it in child development. If you keep feeding your child, you're going to always be feeding your child. They have to learn. If you're still tying your kid's shoes, you're going to be continuing to tie your kid's shoes because they're not learning until you make them do it. They must learn. They have legs. Let them walk. (laughs) They have a mouth, and hopefully you've taught them how to talk. Let them walk up to the counter at the fast food place and order their own food. They have to learn how to grow. they they got to have these moments of maturity developing things taking place in their lives. Agreed? I remember when we first let our children start feeding themselves for the first time. I mean, it was a mess. All over their face, all over their, you know, their chest. We took their, at least took their shirts off, so that wasn't getting messed up. But, you know, it's all over the high chair. It's all over the floor. They're trying to feed themselves. They're frustrated. They're getting it all over the place. Eventually, because you let them continue and you clean up the mess and you do it again the next time, eventually they start landing that spoon between their lips. You ever been there? But at first, the child's getting frustrated because before, all they had to do was just sit there, and here comes the food train. What do you mean i got to do it myself? They want to take the easy way at first. And as parents, it's tough to watch. As parents, we want to intervene. As parents, we have the mentality of, my goodness, this is rough. It would be easier on everyone around if I just did it myself. but you're hindering child development. Our God works the same way. Our God works the same way. He has areas in our life that need to be matured, and we we would be greatly hindered if God just continued to do everything for us. He wants your faith to grow. Changes in routine encourage growth and development so that they can become adults who eventually have their own families. You understand that? 18-year-old boys must be allowed to make decisions on their own if they're going to become men who make good decisions on their own. I know some parents who will not let their children engage in some of the just basic daily chores around the house. And they say things like, well, you know, 
If I let them do it, it's not going to get done how I want it done. And so I'm going to be just going around behind them and doing everything again anyways. And it's just more of a mess. It's just better if I just do it myself. Well, they're not growing. They're not developing. Of course you can do a better job. They're children. They have to be trained. There have to be room for them to, to make a little bit of mess as they're learning. And you, you clean up behind them because they're learning. They have to be trained. Otherwise, they're never going to grow to the level of excellence that you possess. And it, listen, as parents, isn't it our goal and our prayer that they excel us? Heaven forbid if you're a parent and you hope that your child is under you in some way. Put some kind of a cap that here's, here's, here's where I'm at and you can't pass that. That's silliness. What parent thinks that? Every parent wants their kid to excel more than they did. Well, that's going to happen through you giving them moments to develop. God is no different. Good parents who are raising quality people allow children to make mistakes as they learn, and they still walk with them through them and clean it up. God does the same thing. God does the same thing. He wants us to develop spiritually and mentally, emotionally, physically. He wants us to depend on Him for all things. And in order for that maturity to take place, God has to allow us to go through some times where He doesn't immediately respond to our every cry. How do we maintain and still get victory through these dry moments and feel like God hasn't left us? Well, you need to know what the Bible says. <laughs> He's allowing growth in these areas, and so we need to understand that God is always with us. He will never leave us. He's never going to let you drown while you're trying to learn how to swim, so to speak. There comes, there comes a time in our lives where character must be developed. Must be. And the wilderness is a place where this gets done. And so if you find yourself in a wilderness moment, understand it's because you have things that need to be changed. The wilderness is a place where God feels miles away and His promises feel even further, but the reality is God is close at hand more than ever. Isaiah 49, 16 says, We are etched in the palm of His hand. And I love the way the amplified ver version of this says it, that we are permanently imprinted or tattooed in the palm of His hand. So if anything, in this wilderness moment, God is, you, you have God's attention more than ever, not less. Not less. Listen, if you're teaching your kids how to swim, hopefully you're not just throwing them in the pool and walking away. I know when we were training our children to swim, we got in the water with them. Selah. I think it's important to understand that God's right there in the deep end with you. But we get in the water with them, and maybe our hand is on their belly, and we're telling them, okay, kick your feet. Okay, you know, paddle your arms. We're showing them the movements. Here's how you hold your breath. And eventually we start taking our hand off the stomach and letting them kind of sink, and then we pull them back up. And eventually they get it. But the point is, is as parents, we're watching them more than ever like a hawk to make sure they don't die. God is no different. In those moments where you feel like, God, where are you? I'm sinking. He's right there. You have his attention more than ever. That's right. Come on. God promises never to leave us. Hebrews 13, 5 Amplified says to let your character, let your moral disposition be free from the love of money. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. Free of greed, lust, craving for earthly possessions. Be satisfied with your current, present circumstances. Be satisfied with, you, what, with what you have. Because God has said, I will never fail you. I will never give up on you. I will never leave you without support. I will not in any degree leave you helpless. I will not forsake you. I will not let you down. I will not relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. That is a promise from God Almighty that no matter what your circumstances is, you are not alone. You are not alone. God is with you. God's got this. That's not good English, but you get what I'm saying. God's got this. In the wilderness, it may appear like you're going in the wrong direction. It may appear like you're going the opposite of your dreams and your destiny, but God's got this. 
It may seem like there's no growth or no development. It may seem like there, that really there's regression. It may, it may feel like you're unloved and, and ignored and that God's presence is somehow diminishing, but we have a promise from the Word of God. You are not alone. You are not alone. Even if you're making some of the wrong decisions, maybe you feel like you're a little off course, you're not alone. God is right there in His grace and His mercy and will help you get back on, path, back on the right path and will redeem time when we repent. You're not alone. The wilderness is a time, again, understanding this, so that when it happens, you don't lose your bearings. Understand, the wilderness is a time when God gives you daily bread, but not necessarily an abundance of things. It's a time when basic needs are met rather than things that you want. It's a time where you experience socially and emotionally just what you need, not what you want, even though it may not seem like it in the moment, like a good parent, God is with you. God is with you. And God knows exactly what you need. God knows exactly what you need. God knows exactly what is the best thing for you at the current stage of your life, even if it's not what you think. God knows best. God knows best. You know, in America, if we don't get what we want or don't have what we want, we call it lack. And we say things like, oh, lack is of the devil. Well, it's true. God does want us to prosper. The problem is, is our definition of need and want may differ greatly from reality. Our definition of need versus want may, great, may greatly differ from God's definition. Come on. Oh, well, Pastor Bill, you're going to meddling now. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to tell you the truth. In the American church, I believe that we haven't learned what Paul meant in Philippians 4.11 yet. That says, I've learned how to be content in whatever I have. Because he understood in verse 13 that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Paul learned that through the strength of Christ, he could be content in dry times as well as abundant times. In America, we're never content. Those with abundance are no more content than those who suffer lack. And if we don't possess everything that we feel is ours right now, then we call it lack. And we, and, we, and we kind of, in a sense, we judge mankind's spiritual maturity by the possessions that they have. Come on. When really what matters is their character. Now let me just be clear. That doesn't mean that we can't abound in things. We're just talking about the wilderness. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, God is able to make all grace abound, and that in that you will always have all sufficiency for all things. You will have an what? Abundance of everything needed for every good work. So it is our, our, the plan of our God to prosper you. It is God's plan for you to walk in abundance. But today we're specifically talking about the wilderness. And we're just saying that in the wilderness may not be the time God is ask, answering the prayers for wants. Job 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. So this is God's plan. He's saying that to believers. So we can have nice stuff that we can afford. We can have nice stuff that we can afford. But if you're driven by stuff instead of the kingdom, we have a problem. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, The love of money is the root of what? All kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. I'm telling you that our spiritual maturity is never measured by our wealth or the possessions we have. The children of Israel left Egypt with great possessions. They took the plunder from the Egyptians when they left. And according to Exodus 12.36 the Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably upon the Israelites, and they stripped Egypt of their wealth. Verse 35 says, The silver, the gold, the precious jewels, and fine apparel, they took it all. And so the Lord blessed them, and the Lord prospered them as they came out of that slavery on purpose and for a purpose. It was to bless the next stage of their journey. He had a plan. 
But instead they used those things, those precious things, to build idols in the desert and worship them. They danced before them and called them their God who delivered them out of their bondage. Do we ever see that in America today? People worshiping their wealth and their stuff. Clearly, their possessions did not indicate godliness. The opposite was that it was in fact true with the children of Israel. Their possessions became their God. And as a result, only two members of the original Exodus team actually made it into the promised land. Only two had enough character. Numbers 14.30 says, except for, except for Caleb and Joshua, none of you are going in. Isn't that what it says? Caleb and Joshua possessed a different spirit than the world around them and followed the Lord God wholeheartedly in everything that they said and did. Numbers 14.24, my servant Caleb has a different attitude, has a different spirit than others have, and has remained loyal to me, followed me fully even through all the trials. And so I'm going to bring him into the land that he explored, and his descendants will possess their full share of this land. His children and his children's children are going to possess their full share of this land. Why? Because of what Caleb did. Our value system is warped if we value our maturity or our value in general by what we have instead of who we are. Oh, well, so-and-so's got a lot better car than I've got. I better step it up my game. I better step up my game at any cost. No, you got a problem. Something's wrong. And again, nothing wrong with having nice stuff as long as it's not a competition and as long as you're not judging your value by the things you possess. Amen. <laughs> Many times when Christians get abundant finances, they feel like, oh, I, I must have got, I, I'm, I've arrived. God must be approving of my life. Look at the blessing that's coming. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Don't, you need to understand that the blessing is the result of acting godly, not what makes you godly. We've also seen where people get blessed financially and all of a sudden they go on a shopping spree and start spending, spending, spending until their little hearts are content. When maybe God had another plan. Remember when you were poor and you prayed and prayed and prayed, oh God, I sure wish I could give more money in that offering. Oh man, look at so and so, they're in such a need of something. I, I wish I could help that person right now, Lord. And so the Lord sees your genuine heart and decides He's going to use you as a funnel to be able to start blessing people in this area. And now you're spending it all. You're using and misusing the blessing. Come on. Perhaps a person gets a position of leadership and influence and then begins to use that position for their own benefit instead of what God intended. You had character and so God rose you to the top so you could have influence in the area around you and now you're using that for your own gain. Come on. The truth is the financial blessing and the greater authority should have brought us to a place of greater dependence on God, not further away. For His purpose and His leading and for the advancement of the kingdom. You listening? We're talking about the wilderness. Well, how does that apply, Pastor Bill? Well, I'm telling you that the wilderness is exposing weaknesses in your life. The wilderness is preparing you to be able to handle these types of, of promotions so that when you get them, you can actually have them and still honor God. You ever seen a child who maybe their parent dies and they have an inheritance and then they get that inheritance when they're 18 and they blow it all and have nothing to show? The Bible says that an inheritance gained too early in life ends up being like a curse. Why? Because they're too immature to spend the money and they blow it on stupid things. You could have bought a house three times over and you got nothing to show for it. God is trying to bring us to a place where we can actually have the possessions and still honor God, unlike the children of Israel who worship their stuff. Philippians 4.11 says, I've learned how to be content in whatever I have. 12, I know how to live on almost nothing and with everything. I've learned a secret. For every situation, whether it's with a full or an empty stomach, with plenty or little, here's the secret, verse 13. I 
can do all things in my own strength. No, it's not what it says. I can do all things because I have a boss who funds it. Well, that would be nice. Nope. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength to do it, including these wilderness moments. So what caused Paul to be content in these abundant situations as well as the lack? What caused him to have that type of character and that, and that quality, that, that character trait? What caused it? What, what, how did he come to these conclusions? It was the wilderness. It was the wilderness moments that he went through, moments like 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. Five times Jewish leaders beat me with 39 lashes. Sound like something you want to go through? <laughs> 25, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That doesn't mean he went to a marijuana place. Amazing buds came to the rescue. No, that's not what he's talking about. I was stoned means everyone around him threw rocks at him trying to kill him. Three times he was shipwrecked and spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled many long journeys, faced danger from rivers and robbers and from my own people. I've faced dangers in cities, in deserts, and on the seas, and from men who claimed to be believers and were not. 27, I've worked hard and long and endured sleepless nights, been hungry, been thirsty, gone without food, and been shivering in the cold without any clothes. Hopefully you haven't been in any of those moments in your wilderness times. But what we're saying is, Paul went through these moments and it developed character on the inside of him. To where, to Paul, the gospel not being hindered was the most important thing in his life. More important than receiving things. Philippians 4.17 says he sought the fruit and not the gift. Where's our hearts? See, Paul was concerned about the welfare of the people, not his own benefit. Again, what developed that character was these wilderness moments that he went through. Do you see a lot of this character in, in, in our society today? Self-sacrificing? Probably in this room, but outside these four walls, do you see a lot of this? No, if, listen, our, if our focus is not on the heart of God, then that direction is going to bring a lot of destruction in our lives. Come on. God's heart is for people, not selfish motives. So should ours be. Philippians 2.3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Being humble. Esteeming others better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too, and let this mind or this attitude be in you, which is also in Christ. This is the heart of Christ. So it should be ours. God is saying, I want you to think like Jesus. I want you to act like Jesus. I want you to love like Jesus. Jesus was not selfishly motivated. He took our sins. He took our sickness. He took our death penalty and his body. He esteemed our welfare better than his own. This should be our heart. Even though he was innocent, his purpose in life and his purpose in ministry was not self-serving, but self-giving. He denied himself and great, gave us the greatest gift of all time. Again, how more appropriate than to talk about this this week. He gave us the greatest gift of all time, eternal life, to people who did not deserve it. We nailed him there with our sins and our transgressions. You realize that? Yet he willingly laid down his life. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave, not took. That should be our hearts. Such maturity of character is developed in us by God in the wilderness. Why? Because it is a place where all you have is relying on God to meet those needs, to provide in those areas. I'm telling you that the wilderness is a place where the fruit of the Spirit is cultivated. Galatians 5.22 says who? The what? Holy Spirit. You're in trouble if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life. <laughs> the Holy Spirit produces these kinds of things on the inside of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. <laughs> All things that the law does not hinder. There's no law against these things. This is how we should be acting. If the Holy Spirit is in you and 
you're cultivating that relationship, these are the things that will be in you. Come on. The world cultivates the fruit of the flesh. Now, I want you to listen to this list very carefully and see if you identify on any of these terms. You listening? Galatians 5.19 says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are clear. Listen to the list and make sure you're not on it. Sexually immoral, impure, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry. Well, we don't have a lot of idols set up around the nation today, Pastor. Are you sure? How is it that football players can get $1.5 million per game? Idolatry, sorcery, hostility. Sorcery, oh, we're not a bunch of, you know, I don't see a lot of witches flying around on broomsticks around here, Pastor Bill. Well, did you know that doing drugs is the same as sorcery according to the, the ancient language here? In our society where pot shops are po popping up all over the place? Hostility. Just making sure you're not on the list. Quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. I'll tell you as I have before. Listen again, you better, be, you better listen closely to make sure you're not on this list. Because anyone living this sort of life will not words you're not going to heaven if these things are active in your life I'm telling you the fruit of the spirit is cultivated in the wilderness and that the fruit of the spirit is watered by an intense desire to know God more to know Jesus intimately and to love him and please him above all else this is the breeding ground for doing things God's way I'm telling you that the wilderness can be a dry place Spiritually, financially, socially, physically, emotionally, it is a dry place. And it causes us to rely on God to fulfill all of these areas. This is the place where God gives us daily bread instead of an abundance of things. Where He meets our needs in this time, not necessarily our wants. And the purpose of this wilderness thing is to purify our motives. Why is he denying us, the, you know, just giving us the needs and not the wants? He's trying to purify you. Purify your motives from the works of the flesh. And so our pursuit in life should have God's heart, not his hand. We should be pursuing God's heart, not his hand. When we seek God in the low moments, we won't forget about him in the abundant times. We won't forget that it was the Lord who sustained us and gave us that abundance in order to establish His covenant in our lives. We're going to close with this. Deuteronomy 8.1. We're going to read several verses here. Be careful. What's the first words? Be careful. Be careful. Child of God, be careful. Be careful to obey all the commands that I'm giving you today. If you do, you will live and multiply, and you will enter the land that I swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for what? To humble you, to test you, to prove your character, and to find out whether or not you would obey His commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and feeding you manna. Why? To teach you that, bread, that men do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Verse 4, for these 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out, your feet didn't blister. Ladies, how would you like that? You never get to go shopping for 40 years. You got to wear the same clothes over and over again. Verse 6. So, because of these things, obey the commands of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and fearing Him. Seven, for the Lord your God, listen, again, hear the heart of God on this, all you people who don't believe in God's prosperity. All you poverty preachers out there, you better listen. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, 
a land flowing with streams and pool of, pools of waters with fountains and springs that gush out into the valleys and the hills. This land is a land of wheat and barley, grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates. It's a land of olive oil and honey. It is a land where food is plentiful and nothing is lacking. It is a land where iron is as common as stone and copper is abundant in the hills. When you have eaten your fill, again, God's plan is prosperity, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. For the good land He has given you. That is the time. Listen, be careful. He says it again. Be careful. Be aware that when you are in the prosperity, when you're in plenty, that you do not forget the Lord your God, disobey His commands and regulations and decrees. When I bless you, don't forget it. When you've become full and prosperous and have built fine homes and dwelling in them, when your flocks and herds are large and your silver and gold is multiplying, hopefully you got some 401k that's multiplying right now. I know mine is. Along with everything else, when everything's multiplying, be careful. Be careful. Again, he's saying, I'm leading you there. I want you to prosper, but be careful. 14, do not become proud at that time. Do not forget the Lord your God who rescued you out of the slavery of sin. Come on. Don't forget that it was God who led you through the wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was hot and dry and He gave you water from the rock. He fed you manna in the wilderness. He provided every need for you in a supernatural way in these wilderness moments. And it says He did this to humble you and to test you for your own good. He did all this so that... You listening? He did all of this. He did what? Led you through the wilderness, tested you and tried you and built your character for what? So that you would never say to yourself... Look what I done. <laughs> Look what I did. I'm so great. Look at, oh, everybody said it would never happen. Look what I did. No, no, no. He did all this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth in my own strength and energy. No, no, no. Remember the Lord your God, that He is the one who gave you the power to be successful. He is the one who gave you the power to get wealth in order to what? Fulfill His covenant. Not because you're so great, but because God said He was going to do it. The wilderness is a necessary place to develop our character to sustain you in the blessing. To keep you humble so that you don't forget it was God who brought you to this place. The wilderness is not punishment. The wilderness is preparation for the abundant harvest that God has in store for your life and your future. But you must have the character that will hold you there when the blessing and the promotion comes. When God starts using you to advance His kingdom, there's a certain level of character that needs to be there. This is not a place where God abandons you. This is not a place where God forgets you. Listen, it's not a place of rejection, but direction. The wilderness is not a place of rejection, but direction. It's a place of victory. It's a place of equipping. And I'm saying that it is the place where success begins. If we will believe and we will trust and we will obey God, I'm telling you, we will come through these moments and do some great things for our God. Amen. You receive it today? Yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. Thank you, Father, that you, do ne that you never leave us that you never forsake us, you never abandon us, Father, that in these times, help us to understand that in these times where we're feeling this pressure and we're, and we're wondering, God, are you there? That it's a moment where you're teaching us and you're training us, that you're developing, because you believe in us, you're training us for the next stage. Help us to trust you more than ever. Help us to know your word more than ever. Help us to see the promised land on the other side more than ever. May we fulfill your purpose in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I call you blessed.